Hello everybody, uh, my name is Oscar. Uh, I live in Mars Hill, which is about 45 to minutes to an hour north of here, uh, Madison County, very steep, rugged land. We run, I guess we sort of call our place a farm, although it's really sort of iffy, we sort of ride that line. We've been there since 2012. Our original goal was, uh, you know, with influences from the permaculture realm and sort of earth skills, primitive skills scene, we wanted to find ways to use and promote native staple foods. That was sort of our initial goal. Um, so the property we're on has a lot of very large, very old oaks and hickories. Um, we've done a lot of work with acorns and hazelnuts. We've done some work with chestnuts and black walnuts and hickories. Um, really just sort of, you know, basically the niche that we saw happening in within the local food, small, you know, slow food movements is that it's very easy to find local salads. It's relatively easy to find local meat, but local staples is a massive void. And even I would say in local meats, most of them are being fed on grains imported from massive monocultures. So yeah, we, you know, we went into all of this sort of thing thinking that we were gonna run a you know, for-profit farm um, selling acorn flour to all of Asheville. In trying to sort of troubleshoot all of the issues in that, we've come to realize that that's not gonna work. And I guess really just, you know, as I start moving into more of the nitty gritty, I would say that in general, my perspective now and my bent is that the ecologically sound life ways that are available to us do not fit in the current socioeconomic climate. And that's, you know, that's been a struggle for me to sort of cope with that and realize that and figure out what to do about that. Um, but I haven't found any miracle ways around that. So that's a part of why I'm really excited to be working with Living Web is they sort of have that similar, just like Pat was introducing, they have a similar sort of ideas, like there are awesome potentials for like actual sustainable ways to live, but realistically, we need to be looking 50 years in the future and say, what is this landscape gonna look like? So yeah. Let's start getting into some pictures and whatnot. Okay, so uh, these two ladies are uh, both from the Miwok culture in California, sort of upper central California. They, according to their oral history, they've been subsisting on a diet of about 50% acorns for 15,000 years. So again, sort of within what I'm looking at and the context that I look at this stuff from, this is what an actually sustainable culture looks like. These people are living on the same soils with the tree genetics that they've inherited from 15,000 years. You know, compared to our annual civilized culture, that entire system has been around for about 15,000 years and has had to move around the world to constantly find new soils to mine. So, yeah, this is, this is my inspiration. I want to be these ladies. And, you know, these pictures sort of give this image of like, oh, these pictures were taken probably 50 years ago. Some friends of mine went out and met this lady. So these ladies are still doing this. This isn't like an ancient thing. Uh, you know, one of the main comments I get when I'm promoting this stuff or selling cookies or whatever is people will say like, oh, I heard the pioneers used to eat acorns or like native people used to eat acorns. They still do. These cultures are still intact. They're still doing this. They're struggling to try to survive in the overwhelming, uh, you know, badness that is being pushed on them, um, but they're still doing it. Um, another example, of intact acorn culture is in Korea. 
they, uh, you know, according to their histories, for at least 10 to 15,000 years, there's been an acorn culture there. They actually still have, they have a sort of small scale industrial acorn culture there where you can go out and harvest acorns, bring them to a depot that has all the machinery to process it down. The main product they uh, utilize though is, they call it detori muck. They extract the starch and make this jelly, this like gelatinous tofu type of stuff. Personally, I don't find it appetizing at all, but it's very much a sort of Asian thing. Um, regardless, that sort of model is there. The caveats that I would say that of why it is hard to implement that here is that there's a culture there, those people inherited of managing and harvesting from those oak trees for thousands of years. And so just starting from you know, neglected forest where we have this sort of uh, post-catastrophic or really sort of ongoing catastrophic state in our forests, it's really hard to get to that point. There's a lot of labor that goes into, you know, thinning out forests and managing understories and all that stuff, um, which I'll show pictures and tell all about my experiences with that. I guess the other thing I'd add is that this uh, link up at the top, there's this guy who has this really interesting blog and he went through and compiled all the archaeological studies he could find on acorns and it's, it's an intense amount of information. There's basically all around the northern hemisphere for thousands of years, all humans were eating acorns. Um, there's a lot of evidence that even annual grain culture really just sort of filled the gaps uh, where the infra infrastructure was already in place for processing acorns and people just used those tools to then process annual grains. Um, so yeah, really interesting stuff if you're into that history. So the other sort of, you know, like I was saying, we've worked with a few different plants. There definitely are, you know, there's a range of potentials for our area in terms of perennial staples. But the two main ones we've honed in on are acorns and hazelnuts. And I've got a slide further on where we'll show sort of the nutritional breakdown and some reasons for that. But anyway, this is basically historical use of hazelnuts throughout Europe. So this uh, map over here is pollen core data from the European continent from 8,000 years ago. And this darkest region is areas where more than 50% of the woody species pollen was hazelnut. These little lighter section was 25 to 50% of the pollen was hazelnut. So that's the kind of scope and scale that I'm looking at of like what a human population needs in order to subsist, to have an entire culture subsisting on this stuff. About 10 to 12,000 years ago, the glaciers receded off of Europe, and the first forest type that came in was hazelnut and pine. And that forest type is no longer present on the European continent. All of the evidence, including archeological evidence, points to huge amounts of humans managing hazelnut groves across you know, an entire continent. Uh, this link up here is to a study done on this particular lake side in Germany where they found an old hazelnut camp and did all sorts of, you know, they did all this like experimental archeology span to figure out how many plants these people were harvesting from and how many humans they think were doing it, how much food they were able to gather. Their, their estimate by the end was that a group of three to 400 humans would be able in that camp to harvest 50% of their annual calorie needs within a three week period. So yeah, and so this picture here is sort of the cultural echo of that. This is, a, a, this is sort of the origin story in Celtic culture of where their original sage received his wisdom about how to live in the world. And their story is that he ate a salmon that came out of the sacred spring 
with nine hazel trees growing around it. So yeah, hazelnuts and salmon sounds great to me. Um, I, obviously salmon we've basically wrecked at this point, but hazels we can actually do something about, so. Okay, another system from Europe. This is called Dehesa. This is in Western Spain, Eastern Portugal. Uh, pollen cores in this area have shown that this landscape has looked the way it does today for at least 6,000 years. This is managed oak savanna. So again, if you look at this picture, this is kind of the scale and scope of what a landscape utilizing nuts as staples looks like. Um, you can sort of see in this mid-ground, there's a herd of animals, it looks like sheep or cows or something. This guy up here is knocking acorns out of the tree to feed his hogs. So you may have heard of jamón de ibérico. It's one of the most expensive meats in the world. It's uh, cured hams from acorn-finished pigs from this area in Spain. Um, they actually have laws in place about uh, the pigs are not allowed to eat any grain at all for the final 180 days of their life. They have to be finished on acorns. The, I guess another thing to note about their system is that their primary oak species is cork oak. So they actually also harvest cork off of the bark of these trees, which that sort of double yield definitely makes economic viability a lot higher for this. Um, they've got all sorts of interesting stuff going on there where they, I, I think it's less common now, but in the past they were definitely selecting and grafting specific oak trees. They do this speci these specific pruning methods to get the best production per tree. Um, but again, so their estimate for per finished pig, they want five acres of oak trees. Um, so again, if you think of like our sort of private property, small farm system, that's just never gonna work. You're never gonna be able to pay a mortgage on the amount of land it would take to pull something like this off. Uh, there is sort of interesting stuff like this going on. There's this place, White Oak Pastures down in Georgia, that's doing really interesting stuff with sort of multi-species grazing. They actually imported some of this breed of pig and are trying to make uh, like Georgian Hamon de Ibirico. Hamon de Georgia, I guess. Um, I'm skeptical that that's really a long-term, sustainable, viable thing to do. Um, I just feel like inevitably they're gonna rely a lot on sort of, you know, tailgating the name of those pigs and sort of hyping up a lot of the aspects of it. And over time, it's just, you know, inevitably, like this guy, when he finishes these pigs, these pigs go to a processor where they have underground caves that are like 1500 years old where they cure the hams. There is no microbe in those caves that is not good for curing hams. They also have third generation ham sniffers who go in and cut the hams and smell them to make sure that they're fermenting correctly. All of that is like regulated. There's laws surrounding who's allowed to do that. You have to pass state tests. It's like getting certified to be an electrician. So trying to pull that off in the US from scratch, having to make money the entire way along, just is a very steep uphill battle. Okay, so now to our continent. So this is sort of the uh, up until recently ecological legacy of this place is we had chestnut forest. So, you know, as illustrated in this, this picture, the American chestnut was called this, the redwood of the east. These were massive trees, like 150 feet tall. In case you don't know, the American chestnut was lost to an imported blight. That's a whole story. I'm not going to get into all the details of it, but basically, for our purposes, the thing I think is really interesting is the reason that Asheville is a city, I don't know if any of y'all have seen this at the Vance Monument in downtown Asheville. Throughout the whole 1800s, there were millions of pigs living in Southern Appalachia. This was the economy of Southern Appalachia, was running pigs through the chestnut forests, finishing them in the fall, driving them down into Asheville, 
putting them on train cars to go down to Greenville, South Carolina, where they got processed into salted pork, which then got trained across the cotton belt to feed slaves, to pick cotton, to then sell across the world. This is a major piece of why the United States is what it is. So again, the legacy of that forest being in place is the crucial component that made that possible. Um, there are people today trying to do stuff where they're like planting and growing chestnuts to then raise pigs on. Again, like with the Dehesa system, that adds so many more factors to try to maintain economic viability, it's nearly impossible. Um, I guess, so on this, this topic, I found a census from my county, Madison County, from 1900 that said there were 20,000 humans and 35,000 pigs. Um, I would be shocked if there were 1,000 pigs in Madison County today. And I, I don't think that's necessarily the best scenario, having that many animals trying to capitalize on the system that much. But, uh, you know, a lot of the, I've gotten some flack for raising pigs in forests, uh, mainly because of, you know, people want to say that they'll cause erosion and they'll reduce biodiversity by eating lots of, uh, you know, rare natives, which is potentially true. What I like to point out is that everything we know today about biodiversity in this area lived through millions and millions of pigs. So it's not necessarily the pigs that are causing the problem. Again, I would sort of point to the limiting factor and the main problem with not being able to do this sort of thing today is private property restrictions. When people were doing this, the laws stated that if you did not want livestock on your property, you fenced them off. They changed the laws in the early 1900s to say that if you own livestock, you must fence them in. If your livestock is on somebody else's property, you are legally liable for any damages they cause. So essentially what was going on here is commons land management, which is the way the dehesas were run for thousands of years, that's the way those hazel groves were run for thousands of years. That's the realistic, sustainable, viable way to manage perennial landscapes is commons, um, which again, very hard to pull off in our current day and age.